And uh, I think it's kind of almost impossible to, uh, we are, you know, we're just, we're these social beings and, and um, I, I'm, I would never think of myself as truly an autonomous thinker. I think, you know, it's the power of others, the, the interconnections that we have in our lives, whether they're older people with older people or with younger people that, that uh, kind of shape who we are and what we do. And, um, and maybe, and maybe, you know, geez, maybe some of that you learn when you're three years old and just moves along with you. That's who you are and who you'll always be. But, um, I, I think I'm a fairly decent guy. I don't really try to do too much ill will in the world. So I don't have any, you know, real, uh, strong negative vibes floating through me that I can that I can recognize at least. <laughs> so um, I think I get along with most people pretty well, whether they're working for me or with me or I'm working for them or with them. For most of my life, at least up through early to mid 40s, almost all of our friends were in the 15 to 25 year older than us. And it's only been in the last few years that that has sh- is shifting. Yeah. Um, and so as you brought that up, it, again, it, it rang true for us as well. And so, it, yeah, that's why it came to mind. Maybe that's me. Maybe that's just going to be the, the case for boomers, you know, as they're, as they get older, they're, they're, you know, they're, um, they're not the focus of marketing anymore and they're not right. <laughs> you know it's it's millennial everything now and um so it's you know maybe that's just part of a natural transition right happens generationally could be i've just always enjoyed being with people who are older because they they had the experience and the wisdom and felt like that kind of helped pave a little bit of the way so i didn't have to i didn't have to make every single screw up because Lord knows I've made enough <laughs> without anyone's help or yeah. guidance. I've always been one of the people that I, I suppose I, I have been trusting of those who have, who have wanted to advise or have, you know, I think maybe I, I've taken their, um, their interest as a positive thing, not as a, I've never questioned their uh, motives. <laughs> as being anything other than positive, let me help you. Um, it, but I do know, you know, and I have known many people who question all and doubt all and must must do something for themselves just to prove it to themselves. And I've always appreciated the shortcut <laughs> someone has <laughs> provided me with just a little nugget here or there, like, yeah, you might think about this. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I won't struggle with that anymore. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, the road's long and difficult enough without having to, to take every single bump on your own. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want to step back to, to something you mentioned earlier that just made me think about collaboration. You've worked with a number of major ad agencies, including Ogilvy Chicago, Wyden and Kennedy. Uh, shy at day, I believe in collaborative relationships uh, in, in, in terms of the work that you're doing. Can you talk about the collaborative process uh, when you're working with great creative talent from major agencies? And uh, how do you, how do you keep a check on egos and get the best work out of, out of the process when you're working together with, uh, again, with other creative talent that has been awarded industry recognition how do you come together and produce the best work? Typically, when when uh, um, I or our firm is working with uh, an agency, an ad agency, because we're a design firm, they have uh, often specific items for us on their agenda to check, and um, so those relationships are. Uh, typically easy because there's not 
there's not too much crossover or there's not too much interference. They're relying on some expertise that we have that they may not have. And so they're, they're looking for us to help them. And that's, you know, that's a good space to be in because there's no, there's no motivation on us not to help them. Um, the, there are other relationships, though, with agencies where they actually bring us in maybe uh, earlier, and we may be engaged in uh, either helping them to, to win the business, or, or or maybe they have won the business, but they still haven't quite figured out what the campaign is going to be, or um, what all the components of of potential they actually have with the account that they've won. And so sometimes, you know, it's a, um, it's a collaboration of of people who are actually pretty like-minded, but have different experiences or have different, you know, places that they've come from that they can bring to it. And I, we collaborate all the time um, just with our own work and our own clients where, um, we don't have any writers actually on on staff, but we're we're hi- highly known for the writing uh, in our work, and that's because we we bring in freelance people and and um, we work with with really exceptionally talented and gifted writers who who I think are awesome idea people, um, and they have they have a different perspective than than you know designers who tend to be pretty visual oriented. So um, it's the, the, it's no different than, than the agency model of having a art director and a copywriter work as a team. Only now you may have a digital person in there or you may have some, you know, some other um, member on those, on those teams and we'll do the same thing. So we, we don't really work much differently than agencies. So working with agencies is pretty easy because you you know many of us actually came out of agencies to begin with so um we know how we kind of know how they work internally anyway and um and then you know the because we are project based um, um there's an added benefit with uh some of our experience because you know if, if you're working with an agency at even a really great agency that creative team that you may be um, working with, including their creative director, you know, the number of accounts they might have worked on in their career, you know, maybe it's maybe it's as much as a hundred. But, you know, personally, I I probably have more like one thousand. So um you know the the things that we've experienced and the and the kinds of things that we've done because it's project based we we have a lot of just a lot of built knowledge um and you know and again experience that few people ever in in the industry kind of get those opportunities but designers get you know get the chance to work on many many kinds of projects and kinds of accounts well, as one of the designers, uh, the minds, the talents behind the Tazo Tea Company branding, uh, work that changed American perceptions about tea, talk to me a little bit about the, the process of how that came about. I mean, it, it spawned a lot of copycat brands. A lot of things came out of that work mm-hmm. that a lot of people probably wouldn't see on the surface. So talk a little bit about just as one client, if you don't mind how that came to be, some of the process around it. Yeah, just some of the thinking. There were a couple of guys that had um, had a company called Stash, that, which is still out there. Stash T was started here in Portland. And um, they basically kind of lost it in a, um, I, I don't know if you'd call it a hostile takeover, but but they lost their their majority interest in the company because a Japanese uh, conglomerate had had purchased shares and and got a, enough enough of it to kind of take control of the business. So they sold their 
they sold their uh, shares in the company that they had started. And one guy named Steve Smith was very interested in, in pursuing new avenues and new directions and, and, and a new, a new sort of take on tea. And he had lots of sort of botanical and herb uh, experience and, and natural foods experience in his career. And so um, his, is one of his partners is a guy named Steve Lee. So there was Steve Smith and Steve Lee. They both had um, known a friend of mine whose name was Steve Sandoz. So there were Steve Smith, Steve Lee, and Steve Sandoz. Wow. Uh, Sando, Sandoz worked at Wyden and Kennedy. He was the creative director at Wyden and Kennedy. And, and he was a writer and and filmmaker and director and and just kind of just a totally brilliant funny crazy guy and i collaborated with him on several things kind of side projects um uh, for him but you know good business for me and um so he had recommended that they get together and um and meet us so there were four steves sitting around in my office And really the only thing that they had figured out because they didn't actually have a product yet and they didn't have a name for their new entity yet. They had a kind of a working name called uh, Elixir, but it was actually trademarked, taken, so uh, they couldn't use it. And the idea that was kind of roaming around and he had an architect friend drop some sort of space uh, concepts, which was uh, Marco Polo meets Merlin, and that was somewhat based on the the notion that tea was something like seven thousand years old, the oldest beverage in the world, and the and the second largest beverage consumed in the world to water. And um, you know, they they thought, well, we could we could we should just do something interesting and crazy and. And uh, and unique in this category, and and so there were there were a couple things that were going on. Snapple was one. It was sort of taking over as this fruit infused and iced tea drink coming out of New England, New York, um, and doing quite well at the time. And and then Republic of Tea, which was a hot tea based concept that was packaged in these elaborate tins and 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 selling it you know for prices that no one had ever really seen in the tea industry before and their notion was to do something more like snapple was to do something that was more concoctions of using you know botanicals and herbs and fruit and and tea and making drinks that were actually not pop replacements which Snapple had always been significant amount of sugar or high fructose corn syrup. When they say the best stuff on earth, stuff is the operative word. Um, so, you know, what if it was truly more about tea than it was about stuff? That's funny. And uh, um, so that our, our, our brief basically for Sandoz and I was, you know, Marco Polo meets Merlin. And uh, that was really fantastic in in many ways maybe the still maybe one of the most visually rich briefs i've ever received in the shortest one by far um so sandoz came up with the name tazo and i kind of helped develop the identity and the look more around alchemy and uh and mysterious codes and here's where calligraphy came in you know i did a lot of crazy sort of gibberish lettering that was nonsensical but fun and um used used uh a a tablet of various type uh his, historical type like sanskrit and arabic and um chinese and old english and middle english and Greek and Phoenician and Roman and so we used all of that history and we kind of we kind of rewrote history as our you know to our own device and had had fun with that 
um, Tazo, you know, 